Today's speaker, Dr. Boyce Collins from the Engineering Research Center, where he's a research scientist entering his eighth year of service at AAT. Uh, he joined in February 2010. He has 10 years of industrial experience and uh, also a PhD in inorganic chemistry from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Certainly. Thank you very much, Dr. Pai. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for visiting. Um, uh, so, yeah, so my background in uh, as a chemist. Uh, but I did a lot of material science in my postdoc years and then worked for startup companies, uh, uh, audio speaker companies, uh, ultra capacitor company, uh, manufacturing lines. Uh, so I had a varied interest. And then I'm always surprised to hear these numbers like eight years I've been working here because it does seem like yesterday that the millennium came in, but I guess that comes with the territory. Uh, so uh, I have been lucky enough, many, several, several of the roles I have, that as, as a member, as a research scientist in the Engineering Research Center for Revolutionizing Metallic Biomaterials, has been uh, the upkeep and training for a very high level micro CT. Um, so, i uh, start off the slide just kind of reminding myself about uh, a lot of the equipment we have is sponsored by grants by the federal government. There's a reason why we on campus want to accomplish certain goals and tasks. We, we match those ideas with people who have the funds to support that. That's known as the grant writing process. And uh, ideally, those two things merge, and that's what we're driving. So a couple of the highlights of what the Engineering Research Center of Revolutionizing Telephone Biomaterials is about, as well as the NSF grant that supported uh, buying this almost three quarters of a million dollar instrument, um, was the fact that we're, we're here to uh, foster STEM education and foster STEM disciplines. So science, technology, engineering, math, a lot of us that are really into this, like the STEAM idea where we bring in arts. So we want to kind of make the better world by focusing on these concepts and principles. Um, collaboration is really important as, as part of both of these tools. And one of the things that you'll still see in today's talk is there's a lot 
of collaboration. Much of what I'll be talking about is simply my helping to facilitate other people. And that's really, uh, this talk is more about the maturation of my ability to uh, help others. And that's kind of what I hope you, maybe you'll get from this, is that you can bring in your ideas, I can help you with that. You can bring in an idea for a grant, we can help focus on that. Um, to train students and, uh, in entrepreneurship and innovation. So you're gonna see, I, I have this talk is sort of uh, talking on the back end of what you do with this data. Um, and you'll see some tangents that I'm going down, but I'm hoping that I'll, 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 you'll see why those tangents exist um, when, when we're through with this. But a lot of this has what it, what it, what it means to be innovative and be entrepreneurial. You're, you're recognizing opportunities and then you're, you're taking them and trying to uh, execute on them. Uh, and then fundamentally, enthusiasm. So things that are fun and exciting, right? That's what we're all about. Ideally, it doesn't always feel like our math class that it's fun and exciting, but every once in a while you start to solve a problem with all this complex engineering skills that we're learning and you're like, whoa, yeah, this is great, right? And then that, that, that drives you more. So a lot of what we'll see today is hopefully going to be fun and exciting. Um, so I just start by kind of showing some of the, the classical things that we've done in this little picture here where we, we, in the ERC we divide ourselves up into red groups, which is materials. So we do a lot of focus on what uh, individual piece, in this case of the biodegradable metals, and we focus a lot on magnesium alloys. And so we do imaging. I, I'm going to assume in this talk that y'all understand x-rays and what's great about them. I can see inside of things. And then computer tomography allows us to create 3D reconstructions. Usually that's the focus of my talk, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, we look at what happens to these materials as they d dissolve in the body. So we look at in vitro systems and in vivo systems and see how that happens. Um, we develop assays to understand this process where some of the byproducts are given off. We look at biomedical devices um, and we also look at education. So this picture up here is the fiber in an apple. So I always like the idea of the apple in education. Um, I've imaged more fruit than you can imagine, so if you're interested, but it's kind, of, it's kind of fascinating. It also illustrates the non-destructive testing aspect of CT where I can look into something without having to break it or destroy it. So, when you're once taking a CT, this is always my favorite slide to give because I realize that time people would just say, hey, give me a CT image. And I'd be like, well, that's great, but you don't just like pull the trigger and take a picture like a snapshot. Like <coughs> but the technology is getting there, ironically. Like, and we could talk about this for a long time, and I have in the past. Um, so I'm just basically going to say quickly the method is you take a physical measurement. So I'm going to put a sample inside of the x-rays. I'm going to set it with certain parameters. I'm going to take a series of pictures. I'm then going to process all that digital data. So the idea is that I take a picture here, and I take a picture here, and I take a picture here, and all the way around all these pictures. And the computer can process all that, kind of recombine them into this, take all these 2D shapes and combine them into a three-dimensional shape. Um, we then do some manipulation by comparing different grayscales. Grayscales are just represented how much the x-ray has been attenuated as it's gone through the object. Um, and then lastly, we do a lot of evaluation. So this is my favorite part of the slide. I like the slide before, um, but the idea here is that it takes about half an hour to four hours just to take, kind of take the images. And then it takes another, oops, that's pretty good, it takes another 30 minutes or so to uh, process, yeah, we'll just go here. So to, to actually get the data to a 3D reconstruction, it's at this point, I know that my data set's decent, okay? And then the rest of the time is spent analyzing the data. And so I have here to half an hour to 12 plus hours. So some of these samples, We've worked on for years, and we've just started a project with one of Dr. McCullough's students where he's going back to look at some of the data that you'll, you'll see here. So once we have this data, there's a lot that we can do with it. Um, so that's what we're gonna focus on today. So uh, hopefully I'll re represent Minecraft. So the reason I put this picture up here is simply because it's the digi digitization of how we put things together. You can also think about Legos. But the, ultimately, you wanna understand what your building blocks are when, when you're putting together an object, and that's what we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, another reason I want to highlight what to do with the product is because the university has invested in the ERC RMB has gotten several grants to get even more imaging equipment onto this campus. So we have uh, over in Webb Hall, there's now currently an in vivo CT. So this is a, our, our CT, we don't use living objects, but uh, we can image mice, um, small rats, small rabbits, things like that, right, lizards, you know, you know just think, but small animals, right? Um, but we have the facilities now on campus to do that. So this as the bioengineering group, as the engineering research center for religious and metallic biomaterials, whatever your interest might be, biology, et cetera, we now have the capabilities to start creating more 3D data sets. Um, we have a confocal microscope housed in the IRC uh, building as well. It's a very, very nice instrument, um, but we can now do 3D mapping of cell cultures and, and other objects, even materials, 
I'm not an expert on this yet, but I do know the stuff that you get out, we can manipulate as well. And then we also have a lot of instrumentation that does 2D mapping. And so 2D and 3D, we've all taken the calculus course, right? So you're like, oh, this is one dimensional, this is two dimensional, and all of a sudden you have to do n dimensions, right? So we're gonna to to talk a lot about just doing things in 2D as an analogy for what we can do more in uh, three dimensions. Um, but we're, we're building infrastructure on campus to help us access this, this, this information to, to produce it, but also to manipulate it when we're done with it. So there's a lot of software and other improvements that we hope to make in the future. So why do we want to have the ability to do uh, 3D data manipulation and interpretation? The first is virtual physics data input. So the, the, the calculational power of computers allows us to do a lot of in silico experiments. This saves money in terms of how I can design an experiment without having to buy a lot of metal pipes and run fluid through it with a bunch of dyes and make high-speed cameras. I can now build virtual models at, and, and investigate the materials and change the properties with computer code and run a lot of experiments that can help me design a better experiment. I can also do things with animals where I can maybe map out bone structure and think about where stresses are in animals and things like that. So this all needs good data input um, in order to get the, the results out that you want. Um, this is also very, very important for your careers. I know you all have probably have taken a class or two in this already, um, most of y'all. Uh, I'm a little bit older than that, and I think I took a how to use your calculator. It's actually a real class that I took at one point. <laughs> Numerical analysis. Uh, so um, the other is 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And so uh, one of my favorite talks was given by the, uh, the gentleman that started the Maker magazine. But he, his joke was that basically everybody's making landfill with their 3D printers. We're making a lot of whistles. We're making a lot of things like that. But it turns out there's actually a huge application where we're doing this. And this actually has to do with additive manufacturing. So some of us here are involved with people uh, doing metal uh, 3D printing. So making uh, laser centered and making different structures out of them. Uh, I know we're uh, Professor Desai, I think, has, has, has written a grant with some other people on campus that pretty soon we should have a nice 3D printer on campus that's doing metals. Um, so, and but plastics are also pretty interesting as well. And there's a lot of things you can do with this. And you're going to see several examples throughout the talk where I think this is kind of important. Um, but it's not just about toys these days. 3D printing actually helps save lives. So there's a hospital uh, in hospitals in Boston University in a program called SimPeds. And, and basically the concept is surgeons with a lot of children maybe have malformed heads when the, before a surgeon wants to do brain surgery on them or, or something like that. They, they like to be able to maybe even practice on them. So they're doing scans where you can map out the bone structure and actually practice on the plastic piece before you actually go in there and have to go, oh man, what's that? Or whatever. Uh, vertebrae surgery is also another very important aspect where people are scanning the bone structure the doctor can, can practice and figure out how he's going to approach the, the human body when he gets in there. And this is going to help save lives, save money. So this, this is important. Um, this has become one of my favorite slides. Uh, Richard Feynman is like a personal hero of mine. Um, in the 50s and 60s, a physicist from Stanford, if you a physics guru or, or geek, however you want to call it, uh, you know the three red books. Um, his physics lectures, he's very good at, at bringing the world to the numbers and the numbers to the world in a very entertaining way. Um, so I recommend if you're interested in science at all, um, it's, a good, it's a good book to kind of read about what our discipline can be and how we can think about things. But his quote is that science is a method of finding things out based on the principle that observation is the judge of whether something is or not. So that really is our fundamental tool, is what we can see. And so the analogy with CT is, is, is apparent that I am ultimately observing things. How I observe those things, what I do with those observations, how I then test those observations and reobserve to see if what I predicted affects the way that I believe it should be seen and then be willing to be humble enough to say, hey, it looks different than what I expected. Those are sort of the, the, the mentality that as a scientist, I always try to bring to my work. Um, so, to understand observations in CT, we need to understand digital imagery. So, y'all remember the movie Pixels? Anyone? So, great, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, but anyway, this is a movie where all the video games are in the big 3D creatures, right? And, and they went around and I think I've got the gentleman that flung back. But, you know, all the skills that I learned in high school came back to do good for the, for the state of the country. But the reality is, this is really pixels. These are two-dimensional objects here. These are actually what we call voxels. 
So a voxel is just a three-dimensional cube of space, and it can be a rectangle, it can be something else. But that's how we store data in the CT. Ultimately, in the computer, what it sees is a x-coordinate, y-coordinate, z-coordinate, and then some number that represents some shade of gray. And then it goes to the next part of the matrix. So it's just a 3D matrix with a bunch of grayscales in it. It interprets it, whatever computers do, and uh, gives us the image that we're going to be looking at. But understanding that, you'll hear me, though, because they're similar, 2D squares are similar to 3D cubes, I'll interchangeably use those, those uh, terminology. Uh, so 2D pixels, like I said, teach us a lot about 3D voxels. Um, I found out, I have undergraduates that help me work on this project, but this is a very, very famous picture. <laughs> and apparently it's the picture that's used for resolution. Um, but the thing to note about this is which picture is best in this group? We would all say, oh, obviously the one on the right. But if I'm flying a planetary probe in 19, or I'm going to go to the moon in 1969, we got there, right? So, uh, and I have to send this data back, maybe this picture is good enough because of the fact that this picture takes a lot, has a lot more information, a lot more bits involved in it. So again, y'all's generation is quite amazing. The, we continue to push the edge in terms of gigabyte files and even terabyte files and things like that, but 72, uh, five megabytes is not a big deal for us, right? On our phones, we can do that, no problem. We take pictures of it every day. But ultimately, when you reach a certain realm, the size becomes important. And we see that a lot with our uh, 3D imaging as well. So I can ask you all what's the, what's the best um, size here. And this pink one is really the prettiest one, it's the smoothest you can imagine. This is a mouse foot. So it's about the size of the end of my pinky or your pinky. Um, but I was able to use, actually I used this one on the top and did a little bit of software work. The reason I used the one on the top is because it was about five uh, megabytes instead of 182 megabytes. So my computer that I have at home to work with my little $100, $300 uh, 3D printer to print this um, it is the right file to use. So understanding the, your tools, understanding the size of your computer before you want to do a calculation is hugely important to this process. And we can have, uh, I know I can have testimonials from the audience here, some of y'all that have worked with this a lot, but, but that, that becomes an important consideration. So sometimes the prettiest picture isn't the best one you want to use. There's a trade-off always in the quality of data and, and what you can do with that data. So that's another kind of lesson learned. Um, the other thing to talk about is, so then if it's important to figure out which, which size voxel or which size pixel I'm going to use, maybe I need to understand what happens in digital imaging. So for the next few slides, we're going to be looking at a red stripe and a blue stripe. So in this case, this is a, these are similar, this is a one by one array, a pixel, and then here we have a two by two array, and here we have a four by four array. Depending on where I capture this information in this particular block will depend on what my final output is, because what goes into each voxel, that's kind of cool, what goes into each voxel is uh, going to be, that cool, it? Um, what goes into that voxel is ultimately an average out over the whole of that voxel. So if I image this red and blue stripe with this, I'm going to get like a light purple color because it's going to be averaging every, all the information inside of this, this pixel. A little bit of air, the white gray stripes, and some red and blue, and so that's going to turn into light purple. So similarly, if I line it with the second one down here, I'm going to have a light blue and a light red stripe. And then lastly, if I matched up just so, I'm going to get a perfect representation for what I started with. So this is sort of the reality. This is what we're observing. What does it tell us about the original? And which of these is most useful to us to move forward? This one only takes uh, one bit, or again, correct me if I'm wrong, computer people, but maybe it's two bits, I don't know. There's a zero and a one for colors, probably eight or something. But at any rate, so this is going to be 16 squares. So you can understand that's what we're kind of looking at. So ultimately, pixel alignment's not going to be very easy. I can't just hold my camera just perfectly for any given object, especially if I'm rotating it and moving it, and there's a lot of things going on. So <coughs> we're ultimately, we're going to have to get, we're always going to have kind of an average or a blurred representation of the object. So can we look at the thing on the bottom right and say that that's a red and blue stripe? Well, not unless we've done this a lot, a lot of times. So let's think about more pixels. So I can put this in this matrix, and I can start to see something that's starting maybe to think about. There's a red and blue stripe, and we'll get one more. I hope. There we go. 
So we fundamentally come to a rule that the voxel size of the pixel size should be about a third of the size of your features that you're looking at. And so for digital math and algorithms, we can figure out that this sort of object, no matter where it lies on this pixel, on this grid, we're basically going to get the same shape or same color scheme. And so we, we can know that that's probably as many as we need. However, and you're going to see this in, in a couple other examples that I show later, that sometimes this is, this is a reality. I know that there's something, even though this is just a purple blob, I know there's something that that box will capture. So that is, is partly informative. But it also is the reason sometimes in our digital imagery that, that things are blurred because at the edges where I have, I'm capturing something in a particular voxel or pixel that's partly material and partly air, it's going to be a combination. So it's going to be hard to actually distinguish between the two. So this is an x-ray image of a lemon. I told you it did a lot of fruit. Um, so these are the kind of good straightforward examples. But I, uh, so this is what one 2D x-ray of a lemon looks like. And we know 2D x-rays are very useful. We get them all the time with our teeth and hopefully no broken limbs, but that's a, something very quick and easy in the modern medical world. Um, 3D imagery though actually becomes much, much more sharp. So you can look inside of the lemon even better and it's more resolved. Um, this is a typical pattern that comes out of the CT where I'm going to look at a 3D object and then the three slices, X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z planes. And I'm sort of going to look at my object. Um, right now, the way that this one's set up is this doesn't look like a limit at all. That's because I'm including all of the data that was in, was, was in the scan. So all the air that was in the scan is shown here and other things. And that's represented here by these histogram bumps. So this first little bump of data is, is, is the air that was surrounding the lemon. The second one is actually the lemon itself. Um, and as it turns out, this histogram map is as important or maybe more important than the imagery that we're going to see here. Although we're, we're much happier with the imagery. Uh, we'll show you some examples of that a little bit later. So once I, once I have collected the data, I can do anything with it. It's a computer file. So just like, uh, and I used to say Photoshop, but now I realize it's Snapchat. Is that what Instagram? But you got to take pictures with filters and stuff, right? So I can put a hat on my head or I can do all these things to my data because it's just a computer file. So as a scientist, I have this kind of responsibility to know what I can do to my digital data and what I can't do to my digital data. So we see this lemon actually has an artifact on the top. So it would be acceptable for me to take away that artifact digitally by just changing the pixels that are there. Um, just like it would be okay for me to take a picture and get red eye, that's okay to do in a picture. But I can't necessarily give myself blonde hair or maybe, unless I'm having fun, you know, it kind of just depends. Maybe for a mugshot I can't, can't do that. So um, understanding this histogram and how it relates to the object is very important. So this is a little mag magnetic toy about a long time ago. Again, I like little science gadgets. Um, but I imaged this in the CT back in the early days. And so this is how it starts out in the, in the uh, what the 3D image looks like in, in, the, in the sample. So there's a little tool called an isosurface bar, and what it does is it says, turn off everything to the left of this bar, only show what's to the right of this bar. So as I march this bar to the right, it starts to show more, more highly dense objects. So now I can start to see inside of the plastic tubing. Now I can start to see the metal wires, the batteries, the little magnets that are there. I get more and more to the very dense object. So at the very, very end, I'm just looking at the little steel-tipped needle and maybe some of the wires that are still there. But the important part of this slide, oops, there we go, is that I can isolate data, possibly, if I can operate the machine, I can isolate data simply by looking at grayscale. So that's the first thing that you want to know when you're looking at your digital data. How do I get to the part that I want to look at? Um, and this is something that we've gotten a lot better at over the last five years or seven years or eight years, whatever it turns out it is. Um, the second thing that we want to think about is uh, how does the data look? So if I'm saying I'm going to isolate an object, so if I, there's actually, this is a piece of, a little piece of magnesium, um, and then we we scale this up very high. This is at 35 micron, about uh, about it that big on the screen. Um, but we see that this is kind of an example of things we have to think about when we're looking at digital data. All of our data associated with magnesium is actually fairly random. And then within this within this particular sample, there's one spot that has a little pore inside. Um, 
what's the size of that hole? So there's algorithms that exist that actually go in and say, hey, this is a, a black pixel, black pixel, black pixel, black pixel. And then the other ones are, are lot more lighter gray than that, and it can kind of draw a little circle around that. But as we mentioned earlier, when we have voxels and pixel resolution, that sometimes there's, uh, that there's overlap between what's in there. But since we know that on the edge of something, there's this gradient, if you remember back to the blue, we knew it was kind of purple in the middle, and then it was kind of light blue on the outside. We know what happens in the physical world, so people write algorithms to kind of deal with that. So there's an algorithm within software to actually draw lines here to actually help us find more of a truer, truer edge. Um, so there's a process called advanced surface determination that we use that will actually help us draw tangent lines to that original surface that we drew, and then it'll actually make a more accurate drawing in principle is more accurate about actually where the edge really is. So there is software out there to help us find these edges and these shared voxels as we go forward. So um, some of you might recognize this sample, but uh, this is another way that we can isolate what's in our picture, and that's by using geometry. So this is a particular sample. This is a, here it's a Luna Spheres, I believe. Um, it's a powder press sample from Dr. Waters' group from many years ago, but it served me really well. There's a couple artifacts in this particular image because of the way that the acquisition part works that I usually talk about, but I'm not going to talk about today. But I can go in there and get rid of that outside by simply drawing a circle around the part that's kind of consistent and then stretching that circle out into the third dimension and then cutting that out. So uh, we call this 3D cropping or uh, segmentation, another word, and my uh, undergraduate call it cookie cutter. So I think that's actually a great best name for it, but we'll, we'll do a lot of that. But that allows us to get rid of the material that's hard to analyze and we can simply look at the interior. But that's another way. So grayscale and geometry cutting is something that I can do to isolate materials. So here's a few um, examples of how we've used these techniques in the past. And uh, we'll, we'll see here we go. So that we talked about collaboration. Um, this collaboration started, I think, back in 2011, 2012. But this, Nanomag is a company in, uh, out of Michigan that makes uh, magnesium products with a special extruding machine. And they're interested in the biomaterials market. So they contacted ERCRMB, and we created this team over the years. And you can see here there's a lot of people that have made a lot of contributions, but this is kind of like the modern example of how science works uh, these days and engineering works. Um, and that's a subject for another topic. But my job in this particular this, this part was to look at uh, explants from rabbits uh, who sacrificed their lives for our betterment, and hopefully that's what we're going to do with them. But so we, they had an implanted uh, magnesium anchor put into their knee bone, and then they were kept for a couple weeks, and then over time, different cohorts were sacrificed, and we looked at how magnesium interacted with the body, and that's sort of the idea here. So uh, my job is fundamentally to calculate, the, um, to image these samples, number one, but also to look at volume changes in the uh, magnesium that goes on, because our concept is, once you're your tissue heals, you no longer need the bioimplant, and that's what we kind of want to prove. So the very first data that I sent to Nanomag, I sort of had these huge error bars on my samples, and it turns out it's kind of hard to actually get in there and look at the grayscale um, differences because there's a lot of overlap in the grayscale. So a lot of information in this histogram and in the object by simply using a, a geometry, a cylinder cutting tool, it's hard for me to, to isolate a particular region that's just the magnesium screw because the attenuation of the x-rays by the magnesium is very similar to the attenuation to that by bone. So it's hard to kind of figure out which part of this picture uh, and this data set is actually um, the volume. So the summer of 2013, I had a bunch of students work with Dr. Dunham's project as well, um, where we looked at several uh, ways to kind of look at the data. The first was if you have a problem in three dimensions, drop it deck down into two dimensions. If you have a problem in two dimensions, go to one dimension if you can. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Um, so people have done 2D imaging for a long, long time. There's a whole lot less data, and there's a lot of software out there that helps us compare. So we spent a lot of time looking at how people do things in two dimensions. We also looked at the histograms a lot more detail. So it turns out, as I mentioned, it's a random distribution of data for any given component in your system. So Gaussian curves, the normal distribution, can be used to fit any series of curves. So we took a fairly simple sample where we have a magnesium, porous magnesium alloy. So this is a, a 
three component system. You have air that's on, that's inside the pores. You have porogen, which was left over from not getting cleaned out, but that's how you make the pores. And then you have magnesium alloy. But we spent time on trying to fit these curves. And these are great, as I mentioned before, this is actually way more informative than this picture here because I can integrate under the curve and that tells me the composition of what each component is in this particular case. And then we, we played with stenciling. So what we figured out, we learned to do, is we could take a, a picture of the original anchor, and then we could, three in three dimensions, put that cookie cutter over any given part of volume that we wanted to, and then we can stamp out that little piece of, of material. And that's ultimately what you're looking at here, where we have uh, one of the several months later pieces of magnesium as compared to the original volume. So we can see here that the magnesium has decreased in size, we can see that there's bone interfacing possibly, we can see some other things. But this kind of helped us focus in on the object. By focusing in, we reduced our data set, and then we were able to kind of do the same Gaussian analysis. And then we can say within that picture, some of this is gas pockets, some of it's in process degradation, so some of the products, some of it's bone marrow, some of it's intact anchor, and some of it's trabecular bone. Um, and then it wasn't quite fitting just well, so you'll see there's one more disc of Gaussian. So the trick here is you can fit any curve that exists with an infinite number of Gaussians. It's one of those, a very transform theory, and you guys study that too, but that's, that's one of the great things about math. But we want to be careful about making it just fitting the curve. We want it to make sense. I can never get it to quite fit. So there is this third, uh, I said that. there we go. So there is this, this last, the sixth curve here, which actually is a mixing function. And what it represents is those voxels that have half material in one and half material in the other. So ultimately, if you want to fit these curves, you've got to think about a lot more than just your simple components. But we can fit this really well, and it helps confirm our assignments on the previous page. So then we can go into here and say with confidence that this is approximately 85% of this picture is integrous implant. So you can see how we're teaching ourselves what's actually in these CT images, I hope. So then when we go back later on and report to the collaborator, this is what our volumes are. We can shrink our error bars down and we can now more accurately predict what, what the uh, corrosion rates are and things like that. Um, you'll see that my tile's not more precise, it's less imprecise. So I'm, I'm, I'm always driving precision, but I want to be careful about how precise I actually am. So that more precise and less imprecise are the same thing, but, but there's still a degree of, of, of guesswork and approximation with the CT. And that's another thing that I always try to encourage our students to understand is I'm six foot tall. If you're a science engineer, you should think about significant figures. That means I'm either five foot tall or seven foot tall, probably. But if I say I'm six foot zero inches, that means I'm more precise. So it's always kind of important how we measure, how we report our numbers um, as, as we, we talk with people in different situations. But it does sound kind of goofy to say six foot zero inches, I agree. So um, understanding what that grayscale really is is something that we spent a lot of time understanding too. So histology is a technique that can take up to months to do, but it's the most reliable thing that people use. So we took this bone and we're able to, to uh, a group of collaborators in Pittsburgh, and we're able to stain the material that's in this particular one two-dimensional slice of material, and then they can say in these different locations, there's bone here, there's connective tissue here, there's cells here, and they're able to do these things, and so that helped the study as a whole, but what it allowed me to do, since I have this three-dimensional rendering, and I can rotate it kind of any direction I want, we're able to kind of overlap this a similar picture so you can see here there's a little excess bone here, and you can see that there's a little bit of marrow there. And so I can actually overlap pretty well almost the exact same slice and position with my, my sample. So this tells me now that this grayscale that I see in the future, I might can start to say maybe that's cell material or bone material. But over time, these, these are the things that the grayscale now speaks to me a lot more than it did before, once I know the system and I have an experience with it. Um, I bring this out here because this is a work done by Dr. Zhang and Dr. Yoon. The Dr. Zhang was a, um, a postdoc here who worked very diligently, and I can't emphasize this word, <coughs> overemphasize meticulous, this type of work. But he took CT images and would see corrosion products. He then take that sample, cast it in epoxy, and then very carefully go back to some point and slice perfectly as you can get, as precisely as possible, at that exact same location, and then took that sample to the SEM and did scanning electron microscopy and uh, 
EDS to kind of map the elemental distribution there. And what we learned from that is typically in bio type fluids, anything that's bright white is going to be a phosphate product of some sort, and anything that's kind of a light black is going to be a magnesium hydroxide product. So again, people have done a lot of work to kind of help me along when I look at grayscale and just say, hey, that's probably that, that's probably that. Um, uh, but this is uh, excellent, excellent science. Okay, so uh, this brings me to uh, some of my recent... Could I ask a quick question? Please do. In the nano center, they, they have that hem. Is it uh, helium something? How is that different from what you are doing? Oh, okay. They have the helium... Yeah, they have, I mean, yeah. They have a helium ion something like that. Microscope. And they're supposed to be used for biological systems too. And I was wondering, since we are comparing your imaging with SGM, I yes. was wondering, how does that fit there? Is that something that... Yeah, no, I use for those and for those for it, it, It's a direct comparison to the scanning electron microscope. Okay. My understanding is because the helium ion, it's the wavelength of that part, like the Broglie wavelength. You know what says, but it's it's slightly different than the X electrons that we use in scanning electron microscopy. So that slight wavelength different gives you slightly different resolution. Okay, it's um, better resolution than SEM and all that. Is it? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I mean, yeah. So you can use that instead of your. SEM, okay. but not yeah. the CT that's Not CT, okay. Yes, okay. Yep, yep. okay. And that, no, that's, a, that, that's actually another opportunity. Y'all have an amazing amount of riches here in yeah. instrumentation in this general area of North Carolina. Because when they bought it, there was only three or so in the whole United States, I think. Now they have about eight, so it's a very expensive equipment. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> if I can brag a little, that's the, our CT was also about the third one in the nation. Maybe at some time there might be yeah. a similar amount. Um, but. Uh, and that actually, there's a lot more nano CTs type objects out there from other companies. But uh, no, that's it's awesome. And I actually love to go there some time. Um, so this is a three week old corrosion sample. Um, uh, some of y'all know Kasu, a fellow student who's been working on this project. He's taking a lot of this CT data and crunching through it, creating DICOM sets, converting them to uh, virtual physics programs, doing a lot of calculation on the strength of materials. So stay tuned for his thesis defense coming up soon, and we can join in on that to see that kind of work. But what we learned from that is a lot of times when people look at uh, corrosion, the very last thing that they do is they will take the magnesium piece that has corrosion products on it, which is kind of represented by these little fuzzy lines here, and then they'll dip it in chromic acid. And the chromic acid dissolves all the phosphates, all the magnesium hydroxide, and they're able to look at just how much magnesium is left. So in this particular case, you'll see here there's an inflection in, in this particular sample right there. So there's an inclusion, but I'm going to use that inclusion to actually help me. I can take the original sample where he stripped all of the corrosion products off of that sample, and I can take that 3D image and overlay it directly onto the sample. So just like I overlaid the original magne magnesium anchor, I can overlay this and match this up perfectly. I can then do some cookie cutting, and I can separate this into material, so this is the three week old corrosion material. I can separate these down into part that's never gonna corrode in this particular experiment and corrosion material associated with the sample here. Um, and, and then parts of the magnesium that will corrode. So this potentially helps me think about post after it's happened, why would this part corrode and not this part down here? And that's a lot of, I think we're starting a project with an undergraduate to kind of look at that in a little more detail. Um, but it also allows me, I'm not going to be dollar fun stuff. I'm going to speed up. Maybe I'll operate with the keyboard. Um, so here's another example. This is the pre chromic acid and this is the post chromic acid. So I'm able to actually isolate the corrosion layer. One thing that if all, anybody in here has done the corrosion of magnesium, we're always learning about local corrosion versus uniform corrosion. And I think the thing that pops out of this is we're actually able to see that there is a local uniform corrosion associated with all of this. So the other part about observation that I like and is that we can actually put a, sit together some of the things that we're learning about the samples. And so to me, this sort of little movie is kind of expresses more scientific meaning. It's not the best movie I've done, but, but the idea is it expresses a lot of science. So there is this corrosion layer on the outside, and I can separate the two so you can look at the intact corrosion and the other corrosion. So learning how to communicate with, with visual images, so 4D images, if you will, let's look on the time scale, is something that we're also kind of learning about. Yes? Can we see the rat's foot? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Over here. It's, it's a frozen mouse from a pet store. 
fine thing. So this is another study that I did early on. I'm going to kind of cruise through these things. Um, but this was a, a, a simple experiment where you have an embryo, they cracked an egg, a uh, little bit of the shell, and then you lay in a foreign body, and then you see the vascularization within that embryo keeps growing. So it's kind of a first quick assay to see if uh, what you're going to put into the body is poison or not. And so in this case, the magnesium sample, the blood vessels, you can even see a vessel growing over part of the magnesium. Um, but we're also interested in what can you see with the CT. So we actually took an image of the whole egg, and you can see we can cut this out. We actually found the piece of magnesium. In this case, it, it actually floated down. It sunk down to the bottom. But as we look at the piece of magnesium down at the bottom, we actually see some gas associated with that. So this was an experiment we did like back in 2005, one of my first one, ones. But we're able to use some of the tools within our software to actually figure out, in the difference in grayscale, to figure out what was the magnesium and what were the bubbles. So that's kind of illustrated here. And then we're actually able to go in here and count the volume of each bubble associated with this image. And simply, again, we're just adding up these voxels. So each of these little voxels and the volume of each voxel and the dimensions. In this particular one, I have one million voxels. So that bubble has a certain volume associated with it. And we just keep doing that. And we add all those up. And so that says we have approximately seven cubic millimeters of dihydrogen in our sample. We know from uh, our simple equation, thermodynamic equation that describes magnesium dissolution, that, that we get, we're going to be given off a certain amount of hydrogen gas as the solid bar uh, degrades. So, so just playing with the math just a little bit, making some huge estimations, because this is in standard temperature pressure conditions, you're actually able to calculate there's about 0.3 micromoles of hydrogen gas. So as a chemist, the chemist in me was really excited. If I knew the volume, original volume of the magnesium bar, and then and I can calculate the volume of the magnesium bar as well, I think you can calculate how much magnesium has gone away, and, and I actually can balance out this equation in a real way. So for me, visualizing chemistry, this is the, it's kind of the day that the CT really, really popped for me. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, but I don't know out of time, I know. But more importantly to me is actually I spent maybe two weeks. So this, this would take me probably 20 minutes this day, but I actually spent two weeks and figured out how to crack open the shell. So we're actually looking at the embryo. And so here's the beak of the bird. And then what was interesting to me is you see around the eye, there's actually this attenuating material. Can you all see that little circle? It's kind of up there. But this is the part of the CT that's really fun. There are days where you're just seeing things that you've never seen before and you're really curious if other people have seen before. Um, so. Excuse me. I touch this, it gets water, right? No. No. Oh, there we go. All right. So, my friends and colleagues, so these are um, this is my dog, Jolene, and this is one of my cats, Tori. So, Tori is, you see, they're both kind of looking out the window. It's kind of what they get to do during the daytime. Um, Jolene and I go on long walks in the morning and day, so I talk about my day and it helps my stress level and think about science, what you're doing every day. Um, but my daughter made this picture maybe five years ago. If you want to you can read that, it says Tori catching her first bird. So my sweet cat Corey, Tori showed up about three weeks ago and had this nice meal prepared for herself out in front of our, on our deck. But there was a perfectly preserved little uh, swallow head. So I was able to image the bird head. Um, and actually, what I showed you before is that actually, so the joke, joke for this one is here is that that's where the eyes go, right? When we observe this, that's exactly what I would think. Um, but actually, this is just the bird beak. So if I get this a side note, side tangent, but observation, perception, and interpretation as compared to science and belief is really, really important. Um, I learned this about 10 years ago where basically the, the idea of the Cyclops in Greek mythology probably came from the idea that people would find mastodon heads. So where the trunk would go for this elephant, it actually looks like a one-eyed skull of a one-eyed giant creature. But, and I was always interested in how paleontologists, when they find the bones, how they know that the dinosaur looks like this. I'm always fascinated by that kind of thing. But it's just a small lesson for us to kind of keep in mind uh, as we go on. But this is actually the bird head. 
Um, it's pretty interesting, but and I did find that little calcified eye region here. Um, I spent some time for the past few days, I got ready for the talk, and turned out it's actually called the ossicular ring, or the ring of ossicles, and there's actually papers written all about it. Um, but it's pretty fascinating what we can see in our CT as compared to some optical imaging. Um, and this is one of those tangents. So I titled this little movie called Now That's Bioengineering. Um, so we're just going to kind of rotate the sample, but if you can look inside here, this, pretty, this is like the um, uh, part of the throat. There's some structure here. You can see the hinges involved in this animal. And the size scale that nature has done this on right, is pretty amazing. But these are sort of the opportunities for us as scientists that we have today when we talk about nanoengineering. Um, I had to tell Tori, we got scooped. Sorry, so if y'all publish papers a lot, this is what's getting scooped means that you were about to write a paper about this great research you did and somebody else published the results before you. So it turns out that uh, Zeiss, with their Zeiss instrument, they were able to, uh, in a group in um, actually University of Wilmington as well, they were able to look at swallows. And so here's a CT picture that I took. And you can see there's this kind of air canals inside of the beak. And that's where we're looking at right here. Um, but it turns out that these air, this is actually like air conditioning for the birds. So as the bird has air flow through its beak, it actually helps cool itself off. And they looked at different variations of birds from different climates. And the shape of this was different. So that's kind of a, a neat study. But it just shows you just by randomly looking at some object, we're actually closer to, uh, this is a 2016 paper too. Um, and then this morning, as I was preparing, I was having across this uh, PBS NewsHour report. Um, so they're talking about cameras that are about the size of a human hair. They're talking about 3D printing and, and, and what people are doing with it nowadays. So they're actually creating these photosensitive lenses. Um, they're taking the picture with four lenses at a time and they're calling it foveated. So I've learned that foveated means you it's a digital imaging process, and there's the same picture of the 2D imaging. This is kind of a classic, but this is based on the bird side. So foveate just means you're looking at different perceptions, point of views, and that's how they stitch the picture together. But potentially, by kind of mimicking the predator bird's eyesight, we're going to be helping our self-driving cars not run into each other in the future. Uh, but I said that was kind of a neat coincidence to come across that today. Um, so I'm actually going to maybe make it. So I've got five minutes to go. So we've done a lot of natural products in the past, and we've spent a lot of time talking about bird feathers and how they interact. But hedgehogs are actually pretty interesting little creatures. So on the, this side here, we can see this is the inside of a hedgehog quill. Both of these structures, both the bird feather and the hedgehog quill, are made out of the same biomaterial, or keratin. Um, but there's a, a gentleman in the uh, University of Akron who actually studies why hedgehog quills and why porcupine quills are so strong. So there's a very high aspect ratio made out of the same stuff as my hair, but it can poke you and stick in you, but my hair won't do that to you necessarily. So, so uh, why are they so strong? And it turns out it's their internal, internal structure that makes them so strong. So there are other ways to isolate volumes, and that's just what the last little bit that I'm going to talk about. By looking at characteristics, I can actually use algorithms that actually measure the wall thickness inside of the object, and by limiting my search for objects that are between 12 and 32 microns in this particular case, I can actually isolate, and you see what's colored here is basically most of the inside of the object's colored, but not these outside walls. So I'm able to do a little trick within the software, create a region of interest, and then I can isolate what's on the inside, as shown in this picture here. So here I'm reading <coughs> the hedgehog quill, I'm actually carving out all of the insides of the hedgehog quill and pulling it out. Um, I can do something uh, called an inversion. So I know I picked this. I still have that over there. So if I don't want this, I get that. And that's what we do with this part. So basically here I have the outside of the shell. This is very useful when you're looking at bones. Because in our bones we have uh, cancellus bone, trabecular bone, and uh, uh, the shaft bone on the outside. Oracle bone, thank you very much. That's right. You get bonus points. Um, you still see I need to clean out this a little bit right here, but again, this is an operation that took me about 10 minutes, but it's pretty impressive where we're able to go from when it took me two weeks to go to anything. So now I can really study the outside and the inside of this object and kind of determine which is which. So if you're thinking your object's complex, we're able now to kind of image it, but also pull those things apart and break it into different components in a fairly straightforward way. 
Um, it does take time. So there's a joke in CT conferences, like, oh, do you have to manually segment that? And people are like, yeah, I had to. It took me days and weeks sometimes. But people like, can do some beautiful stuff where they kind of image every organ inside of different creatures. Um, so the title I talked was from Magnesium to Mars. Um, next week, Dr. Jeff Willey, who's one of my collaborators, uh, who works at radi Radiation Oncology at Wake Forest Medical, um, he's interested in how soft, soft tissues are affected by radiation. He studies um, uh, children's pediatric cancer treatment as well as space travel. So when you're in, out in space, and this is the Mars part, so when people go to Mars, we know that they're going to be weightless for a long time because they're in the uh, space capsule going there. Um, it does, we know it affects your bones. They reconstruct this lack of stress. But there's also some unknown ideas of what, how your joints are affected, and that's really where he's spending his time. So next week will be an example of someone who's taken data created with our CT and knows what he's interested in looking at. He'll be presenting some of that work as well. So I look forward to next week's presentations. I hope you will also. Um, I want to dedicate this talk to my friend, Steve Stanley. Sorry. Uh, but he is a, a friend who passed away last, last month. And uh, he's uh, my first mechanical engineering friend, so I have a high respect for the discipline. But it's the, the art. He's an artist for sure. Um, but how engineers are creative um, is inspiring. And uh, so thank you for that moment. And I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Sankar, Dr. Only Go, Dr. Pai, um, for the vision and effort that they had put together the um, uh, ERC program here at A&T. Um, as well as the uh, engineering program, so why we're all here pretty much today in this room. Um, uh, Mr. Couch and Eric Norman, who does a lot of repairs on the machine to keep it up and running, uh, hugely important. Um, Eric also taught me how to hack Facebook, so I got that PBS movie today on, onto, my, onto my presentation. Um, and uh, it's just a little trick, it's, it's out there. Um, and uh, the group students, um, the bio uh, engineering faculty. It's it's an honor to work with you, and I really appreciate it. I hope that you kind of stimulated me to think about what, how this might help you and uh, what the world can be with with uh, the three technology and computers as they go. So thanks a lot. We have time for some questions. Yep. Um, questions yes, sir. Uh, in your Instagram. That, uh, uh, is a computer in the, the voxel uh, distribution? Yes. It's like uh, you have a dense force and the other one? Yes. I see that uh, 